Uh, oh, hello. <laughs> An engagement. Lovely. We like that in advertising. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for that very, very kind introduction. If anyone should get a prize today, it's Tom, not only for his magnificent comparing, but uh, when you go for drinks later, check out his blue suede shoe and pink sock combo. Absolutely <laughs> outrageous. Um, in a good way. So I'm Mel. Uh, I stepped off a plane yesterday morning from Seattle, where uh, I've been living for about 18 months working for Microsoft. I've been working there for about uh, seven years in total as their digital marketing evangelist. Uh, hallelujah. Lots of people cry out when uh, I mention the, uh, the evangelist bit. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today. My, my history, work history, goes uh, a, way, a long way back with um, Trade Double and since they actually started. Um, my role at Microsoft was to really talk about advertising, that's what I'm doing today under my own company, because uh, I left Microsoft last week, called uh, Delightful, <laughs> Delightful Communications. And you know, wh why I called it Delightful will be very, very obvious uh, very, very soon. But my job really today is to bring together everything that you've heard today. And the speakers have done a fantastic job, I think you'll agree. Um, especially looking at all the, um, the tweets, uh, setting me up to give you uh, a few anecdotes, tell a few stories about how brands uh, are good brands are really capitalising uh, on this very crowded <coughs> internet world. At the moment, with more and more people coming online, more and more devices, uh, I truly believe that, that a really good marketer is now thinking about things in a slightly different way. And these tales are about small businesses, big businesses, but also people who have done remarkable things and unexpected things on the internet. Um, I started my career at a company called BT Looksmart. Does anyone remember them? Started, oh, a few. Started uh, back in 2000, and uh, my job was to review 55 websites a day. I, I would go onto the internet, normally Alta Vista, uh, and, and find. Uh, websites and I review them with titles and descriptions. Um, after about three years, uh, Google's uh, uh, spider, um, it turns out, could actually type faster than I could and uh, the company folded. It was a hundred million dollar company. I actually took this photo just before turning off the lights on uh, the biggest internet startup uh, of, its, of its time outside of um, the US. The COO was a chap called Martin Lindstrom who started his career advising Lego in Denmark at the age of four about how to do marketing. Um, and after he left uh, BT Luxemark, he, he wrote a book and he's written lots of books. He's a self-styled brand futurist. But this particular book was called Brand Child and it looked at children and how they interact with advertising and how they interact with brands and how they're very, very important in the home as part of the decision-making process. And one of the interesting stats that I think um, re really helps uh, solidify everything that you've heard today is that when it comes to you and I, anyone, anyone under 25? A few of you, oh, so old. Um, when it comes to 25 and older, we can just about cope with one point something channels of communication. I remember my first laptop in Olivetti with 16 megabytes of RAM, you know, back in 2000. I was really rocking with that. But anything above that, we, we, our attention span, we, we just can't cope with it. But the children, the, uh, you know, the, the millennials that, uh, 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 that were talked about by um, Trajectory earlier, well, they're all over it. You know, they, they can uh, cope with, I think it was something like 4.5 channels of communication. On their laptop, they can be ironing a friend, texting another friend with their mobile phone, listening to music. I don't know, walk down the street these days, and there are kids, and they've got one iPod thingy sticking out of their ear, earphone, and they're still having a conversation with somebody else. Martin's uh, not scientific, but his, uh, his feeling was that, uh, you know, that all these different channels of communication were uh, contributing to ADD. Don't quote me on that because it, it wasn't scientific. So, we talked a lot about mobile today, and I pulled out these stats from Forrester. 
they're different from uh, the double research, which I'm going to blog um, the hell out of after this <laughs> presentation because I thought it was absolutely fantastic. But here, if you look back at 2000, I don't know. Was the tablet, was the iPad ever thought of? Did we ever think that we'd be able to cram, cram that amount of computing power into something so small and thin? 2016, 375 million of those devices will be sold. Not devices that will be in the world, but 375 will be sold. So there'll be almost two-thirds of a billion tablets in there. We all know that there will be six billion mobile phones, but never forget, <coughs> as an ex-Microsofty, I have to let you know that there will also still be two billion PCs. So we're now living in this very fragmented world, which is very, very crowded. You, as advertisers and brands, are competing with other advertisers to really shine, to be brilliant, to stand out in a very crowded environment. I got this picture. Um, I think it was on Flickr. This is actually a beach in, uh, in China. So that's one place that's not on my, uh, on my list of travel places. Um, <coughs> this is my daughter, Maggie. <laughs> Thank you. I miss her terribly. Um, she is 13 months old. This picture was taken uh, a while ago. Um, but she's looking distinctly unimpressed. <laughs> Uh, she now holds my mobile phone kind of the wrong way around and has mimicry, imitation uh, uh, phone calls with people. She knows how to swipe. She didn't like a Jesse J song the other day and she changed it herself. She just went, nah, and swiped it and changed it to the next one. Uh, you know, she's tap, tap, tapping on my iPad as well. And when we heard earlier about the millennials and the generation Ys, I think we really should be setting ourselves up and starting to practice and rehearse for people like Maggie. I'm going to be a very responsible advertising marketing person and encourage her that you know advertising is a, is, is a fact of life uh, and that's why she gets all this free stuff. Uh, but there are three things that I want you to think about uh, over the course of the next 35 minutes and also when you go home, back to your desks um, tomorrow or Monday. And that's I mean, I hardly need to press this point home because so many people have been talking about it. But being agile is so important. I worked at Microsoft. 98,000 people worked there. And I remember Steve Berkowitz, who, who worked at Ask Jeeves, he's the CEO of Ask Jeeves, and he was the guy behind the, the, the four dummies books. He said working there was very much like steering a cruise liner. Every time you wanted to change direction, it would take you a couple of days in order to move. So what I was hearing today, about 39% of the people in the room don't have the budget or resources for mobile. It's pretty sad. I've been asked since 2005, is this the year of mobile? No. Is this the year of mobile? No. And today we hear it isn't the year of mobile, but we're still not set up to be able to capitalize on that opportunity. The, the most retweeted um, tweet, I think, today, or comment was uh, from the lady from IEB who talked about um, you know, test and learn is the only way to cope with change. And I thought that was an absolutely brilliant quote. The other thing is being delightful. To stand up and stand that, that, that head and shoulders when you've all got all these competing brands, I think we very often miss the opportunity to put a smile on people's face. That's Maggie there. She's unimpressed. We want to try and put a smile on her face. We want to try and give her an emotional connection. We want to make her feel good. We want to think about how she uh, interacts with our brand, but, but how she feels, how emotional does she get with it? And there are those opportunities and those tactics to do that if we think slightly more out of the box. And the other thing is being unexpected. A lot of what I'm going to talk about and some of these brands have done some amazing things, but not things that you would have necessarily expected them to do. You only have a very small window of opportunity to capture the imagination and to capture the attention of people like Maggie, you know, in years to come. And actually, people like us. If you think about, uh, I saw an article uh, in the Seattle Times, uh, and it was like, it was from 2005, and it was like 4,000 words. And I thought, I can't read that. I don't read that length of stuff. We're so used to 140 character sentences. 
If you have a, a video on YouTube, YouTube tell us that you have a window of four seconds to capture that user's attention before they think, oh no, this isn't for me, and they click away. So being unexpected suddenly gives people a, a double take. They suddenly think, oh, what was that? And then you can hook them in. And then you can keep telling your story. And hopefully they'll stay to the end. So I'll start with uh, Bartel Drugs. Bartel Drugs, 120 year old uh, uh, company. It's, a, it's like a pharmacy with a dried goods and they sell milk and beer and, and, and whatnot. It's very family orientated. It's over in Seattle. And, uh, and, and you know they wear these waistcoats and say, "How are you today?" And you know, did you have, you know, did you find everything? You? They literally follow you around the store. I mean, it's, I mean, the service is just impeccable. And I was in there with my wife, and, and she was at the magazine stand looking at Hello magazine and all that kind of stuff. And I was looking, as you can tell, I need to get fit. So I'm looking at the fitness magazines, and uh, I'm browsing and just checking them all out, and I see this. Now, over here, we have Runner's World, or Weightlifting Monthly. Over in America, they're so pres prescriptive that they have magazines devoted to certain parts of the body. And as you can see on the right-hand side, there's my thumb, because I took a picture of it. And I tweeted, this is a genuine fitness magazine in Bartel's drugstore, took a pic, only in America. Now, we heard about all that mobile research about people checking their Phones, I'm in the checkout. I don't have a minute to spare. So if I'm in the checkout waiting to pay, pay the bill, I'm going to look at my phone. And I looked at it, see, uh, 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 Twitter, see if there had been any response. And they had. Bartel drugs. They'd been following their work. Someone had gotten an, an alert and said, oh dear, well, we are in favour of exercise. Cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> A smile on my face because I'm paying money. So I responded, Ha! Bartel Drugs just gifted me a fab opening to my next social media presentation. Cheer, gu cheers, guys, and keep up the great work. Didn't end there. As <laughs> they said, thank you for ahem getting behind your local drugstore. And what did that do? Every time I want to get some photos or, or, or any sort of, I was going to say drug paraphernalia. That's <laughs> I was going to get a photo of you know, stuff like that. I, I would walk that extra few blocks to go to Bartels and not Walgreens or Walmart or, or um, uh, you know, the equivalent as or what, or what, or what I hope as it's not in the room. Um, but I have now a brand affinity <clears throat> with, with that company. I, I now. <laughs> have a lovely smile on my face every time I walk in there. And they do this all the time. And HC is a guy called Howie Cohen. And I bet if you tweet, if all you're always tweeting, hey, Bartell Drugs, Mel Carson's on stage talking about you again, he will probably respond because it's 20 past 8 in the morning. And I swear he has the phone in the shower with him because he is constantly engaging with people. But that didn't take long. I mean, he's probably doing six other different things. But he's still engaged with me and he's hooked me for life because... He was delightful. Um, look at this, the royal wedding. Amazing. Uh, when you talk about being agile, even in our industry, we're agile because web trends got together to do this buzz uh, uh, kind of tracking of what was being talked about the, uh, the royal wedding. And they actually did this before the royal wedding and came out with an infographic about the royal wedding before the royal wedding had actually happened. And the interesting stats there, you know, 71% on Twitter. Well, well, one thing that I've, oh, if I ever meet someone at WebTrends, I'll ask them how on, earth, how on earth they knew that there was more buzz when Charles and Diana got married in 1981 <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. Um, and then again, you know, this says a lot about where I live. Um, you know, the, 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 the Americans absolutely love anything to do with the royal wedding, it absolutely went bonkers over there, and there's 2.2 people in Australia probably cursing about it, or, you know, still wanting 
independence from the Commonwealth. But I thought, that, I, I thought these kind of stats were, were, were really interesting, as were the amazing work I missed. I actually came on holiday to visit family in between the Jubilee and the Olympics. I mean, how dumb was that? I completely missed your wonderful summer and I heard about it and I'm very jealous and I'm very sorry I wasn't there. Um, so I'm going to definitely make it to the next London Olympics. <laughs> um, but here you go. You know, nearly three million followers, lots of engagement. I, I, I think they nailed it as far as, um, you know, some of the, uh, the, the platforms that they had out there. This was for the Paralympics a couple of weeks ago. Um, interesting that the Aquatic Centre was like nearly <coughs> three times as many tweets uh, than the Olympic Stadium. Maybe things hadn't started in the stadium there, I'm not sure, but really, really fascinating stuff. And this volume, the volume of data now coming out, and the volume of people now on Twitter and using social media, is just completely bonkers. I mean, 26 million comments, um, IPG and Radian 6. Counted. So that's 26 mentions of anything to do with the Olympics, which is quite, quite astounding. I think, I think back when Windows 7 launched, you know, and that was a global thing. They tracked everything uh, when that was launched, <coughs> and it got, I don't know, seven, seven million impressions. You know, uh, uh, earned media, uh, slightly different thing, but you know, that was two or three years ago. The the, the growth is just exponential. And then you've got Boris's best friend. <laughs> Mitt Romney, uh, over in the US, they were doing this talk, you know, uh, the primaries and stuff, and it's all <laughs> very, very strange. Um, and, and they get up, and he's doing his speech, and during his speech, uh, he did four, you know, he managed to get 14,000 tweets a minute. That's a hell of a lot. But then the following week, Michelle Obama gets 28,000 while she's talking. She's up there. So she's nearly, well, she is, double what Mitt Romney got. And then the big guy gets up there, and he's 52,000 tweets a minute. That was the most tweeted event ever in the history of the world, was Obama's speech. So, um, really quite amazing. And then, um, I don't know what, oh, I don't think, I don't think people track that. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and as far as what happened last week is concerned, um, I don't even want to think about you know, how the internet was buzzing around that. But it really does show that there is all this data out there, there are people engaging, and that we need to set ourselves up to be able to do what Howie did. You don't have to do it to absolutely everybody. There's a lot of people out there that say, oh, there's just too much, how do we choose? There are opportunities to engage. Now, the next one is, this is uh, Father Christopher, Christopher Jamison, my old headmaster. Um, back in um, 2000-something, he had a, a, a BBC2 documentary called The Monastery. And there was a fly on the wall uh, where they got uh, 10 ne'er-do-wells in and to spend 40 days and 40 nights uh, in, in, in the monastery. And he, he came to me and he said, uh, we've got a website. I went, great. He said, no, but I want you to set up a Google AdWords campaign so that if anyone types in anything to do with monks, um, that, that our website comes up. So I went to Google and I said, could you send me all your stop words? Uh, because there are some frightening things that people type into Google with the word monk or nun in it. Um, so I set up this campaign and I just let it run. He put his credit card and off he went. And then he said, uh, uh, it was about five years later, so <laughs> it was a long um, you know, sale life cycle. About five years later, uh, he rang me up and he said, now we've hit the jackpot. And I said, you shouldn't be gambling, you're a monk. <laughs> he said, no, 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 we just signed up our first monk. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, 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 it's really, it's, 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 it's happened, it's amazing. And I said, have you got a testimonial? Because this would be really good for uh, my next social media presentation. And he said, yes, I do. And it went with something like this. And so I began to feel that God might be calling me to the priesthood. I felt I really needed to talk to someone, but I had no idea who to turn to. Well, I turned to Google. 
I think I typed in something like retreats and religious vocation. Top of the list is the monastery website. If it hadn't been for the internet, I would probably still be a software engineer. <laughs> True story. But what Father Christopher did, he was agile. He thought out of the box. He knew. He, he had this spiritual guidance that there were people out there that were so desperately unhappy with their lives that they would use a search engine to find out what they were going to do with the rest of it. Uh, interestingly, I've been asked a lot about the, uh, the stats and metrics that we used for this campaign. Uh, it wasn't CPC, it was CPM. Cost per monk. I'll <laughs> 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 see if you're away. Uh, anyone seen this guy? Some people have. We were unsure whether people had or they hadn't. This is Michael Dubin from the Dollar Shave Club. And he was interviewed recently. Um, are in Entrepreneur Magazine about this spot. It only cost $5,000. They spent hours and hours and hours paring down the, uh, the, the script into everything, I can't give you away, but every single thing you see in the next minute or so uh, has been intricately thought about. And he actually says in this article, what we wanted to do was be unexpected. So let's watch this. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. It's <laughs> <laughs> real, a stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle, a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. It's a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. All a hundred are gonna ship them right to you. Just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? No <laughs> This train makes hay. Blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. <laughs> signed up 100,000 people uh, within 48 hours of that going out, and it still makes me laugh, and I've watched it 5 million of those 6 million times. Uh, now, a lot of brands are, 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 are kind of copying, they're capitalising on, on this surprise element. Uh, any mothers in the room? Rachel, who is uh, um, pregnant, you'll... you'll um, I don't know where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> I used to work with Rachel at, at Microsoft and she does marketing for Trade Double. She got me out of her and is probably now regretting it. Um, so, uh, this is a, an ad that only came out online a couple of weeks ago. First kid? Loves. She's already ordered. So. Yeah. Live, learn, and get loves. Nappies. They're selling nappies. And in 30 seconds, uh, I think they've uh, hundreds of thousands of views. But also, a lot of the comments are like, I'm going to switch to, to loves because uh, of your stance on breastfeeding in public and all that kind of stuff. I don't think they actually meant it. 
that. I don't think that was necessarily what, what it was about. It was more about the comedy. But they've suddenly got all these you know, money bloggers who are on, on, onto them saying, you know, we really love this. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, Connect. Who's got an Xbox? You again? So Connect was, was this technology, the fastest selling consumer electronics device of all time, uh, which had been worked on for a, 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 not actually that long, I think it was only 18 months um, in incubation at Microsoft. But it's, it's the whole thing where you use your body and you're the controller. Um, and, and, and it was very much meant to be an audience broadening device because you know, you've got all these guys you know, all sitting in their caves and you shoot them up. Uh, videos and Microsoft are thinking, you know, how can we broaden the audience so for people like me that isn't interested in shooting them up, you know, might want to play tennis or golf or, um, uh, you know, they, they, they've got all sorts, of, all sorts of games now, absolutely fantastic. But what happened with Microsoft was people hacked this thing and started coming up with, with, with new ways to use it. And when they did that, um, Microsoft thought, that's a bit naughty, but actually, these guys are doing something really cool. And so they decided to change the business model. And uh, they immediately were agile enough to come out with uh, this week. We started with a sensor that turned voice and movement into magic. Xbox, play. We thought this would be fun to play with. Something amazing is happening. The world is starting to imagine things we hadn't even thought of. Unexpected things. Asking us what we'll do with Connect next. We're just as excited to ask the world the same thing. Really impressive stuff, and you know, kudos to, um, or kudos as they say in America, to uh, to Microsoft for, for suddenly thinking, well. You know, this is really cool what these people are doing. Let's open it up. And then earlier on this year, they, they, they opened out for Connect for Windows. And, uh, you know, they have Connect Accelerators going on where, you know, they're helping small businesses and startups really get involved. There's one doing this in Selfridges, um, uh, where, where you can go in and it, it kind of measures your body and, and then gives you a virtual uh, shopping rank and then you can select things and then someone runs off and gets them and you can actually see what it looks like on your body before. And th th there's things that, you know, help ha helping um, handicapped people and uh, um, there's one down at the bottom there which um, is a connect which, <laughs> amazing, just uh, shopping trolleys that follow people in wheelchairs around supermarkets so that they don't, they, they're not, you know, pushing uh, the the trolley at the same time. So, really amazing stuff there. Um, another thing that was <coughs> unexpected, I, you know, I, I've gone on the tooth back in 2000, watched um, Google's monumental growth. Uh, when, they, I think it was a couple of years ago during the Super Bowl, they showed their first TV ad, and a lot of people wondered whether, whether they would actually show a TV ad. Did they need to? And they did it. It was pretty, uh, to me, it was pretty unimpressive. They had, um, uh, it was some guy talking about um, Paris and romance or something. It didn't really strike a chord. Uh, but the following year, um, I think they learned from that, and they did this for Chrome, um, which I, I think is one of the, 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 the best ads that I've ever seen.
uh, that was an ad for an internet browser. Amazing, amazing. It has that real emotional connection, especially you know with fathers. We were doing rehearsals yesterday, talking about it as well, um, and the fact that they managed to bring in all their products and services in together. It'd be interesting how Google Plus would fare in that. But I thought it was awesome. Um, so let's talk about some people. Uh, about 18 months ago, uh, a chap called um, uh, Dr. Paul Springer, uh, who is uh, at Bedfordshire <coughs> University, he's a, um, uh, a professor of marketing and communications. He wrote a book in 2005 that I got interviewed for called Ads to Icons, and it was 50 case studies about amazing campaigns that have been on the internet. And I, hadn't, I didn't hear from him for six years. And suddenly got this phone call saying, I'd like you to help me write my next book. I've been following your career, and especially the interviews that you've been doing with industry luminaries. Um, I haven't interviewed Rob Wilson yet, uh, but I will do uh, b b before my career is over. But, you know, so, so done lots of interviews. And he had a title for it, Pioneers of Digital. And I said, and? And he said, well... I don't know. That just sounds like a good time. And, and then I just thought, wow, there are so many books out there that are about Google or Facebook or practical how-to uh, business books. There's nothing about the people behind some of the most amazing things that have ever happened on the internet, and some of the most surprising things that have happened. Um, so we've written this book, which comes out um, in October. In your uh, goodie bag, must take that with you, because there's a sample chapter in there uh, that my publisher, Coben Page, has provided uh, about this chat. Chi Lu uh, was discovered in the Fundang University in Shanghai, earning $10 a month as a teacher. And there's a whole lead up to how he got there. He was discovered by a Carnegie Mellon professor who said, mm, you're pretty smart, maybe you should apply for a scholarship. And he said, I can't. <coughs> he said, why never not? He said, because I can't afford the $45 fee to apply for it. So this guy paid the thing. And uh, history just unfolds as he goes to IBM Research. Uh, he was in the room when Sergey and Larry first, um, <laughs> first uh, demoed uh, Google Project Backrub, as it was called, um, back in the time. You've got to read the book to see the keyword that they were using to, um, uh, to demo it, because um, it's very, very topical. I won't give that away. Uh, but then he went on to Yahoo for 10 years. He rose up to managing 3,000 software engineers. Uh, and he's now at Microsoft. And he's the guy behind Bing and everything that Microsoft is now doing in the online space. But I want to talk about a few more of these guys. Um, everybody said of Ted. <coughs> put, put, put your hands up if you watched more than 10 Ted videos. Uh, keep your hand up if you watched more than 50. Oh my goodness, wow. Okay, well, good news is you've contributed um, to the great success of this woman, June Cohen, who in 2005 was asked by Chris Anderson, not the long tail Chris Anderson, um, but uh, the, the guy that took over running Ted. Ted essentially in those days was uh, a kind of closed door uh, lecture where you paid something like $4,000 and you, you would turn up and watch these lectures of all these people. And in 2005, Chris Anderson said to June, um, I want you to help me open this out to the world. She, she had um, been working at Hot Wired magazine, and if you guys, any of you geeks out there remember Web Monkey, she was the person behind all that. And she said, well, how do you mean? She said, well, I want to open it up, and I, I want to put it on TV. I want all the talks to go on TV. And she said, all right, I'll give it a go. All her friends thought she was mad. Um, you know, boring lectures, and, and, and they were right, because when she went to the TV companies and the networks, they all said, what, a neuroscientist talking about, you know, brains and goodness knows what, uh, that's just not, that's not TV view. And the real nail was, it was actually BBC4, uh, was the final port of call, and when they said, no, I'm sorry, this content isn't good enough, um, you know, people just aren't going to watch it. She decided to think laterally. She went back to what she uh, had, had picked up in the early 90s at Stanford <coughs> University, where she was uh, the editor of the Stanford Press. 
And because they were so close to where Apple was, Apple had given them a whole bunch of um, some equipment, and especially they used the first version of QuickTime video on, on their intranet, and people could click on it and get very grainy photos of, of people on there. Uh, I think it was some students who had gone to the Olympics or something like that. But she thought, there's this YouTube thing. People are really getting into this online video. There's something that we can do. So what she started doing was she hired a, a, a friend of hers who, who was a video uh, director, and instead of one camera or two cameras in the room, they had eight cameras focusing on that person. And what she did was she turned the whole TV lean back experience into a lean forward experience. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but you never hear the, oh, thank you very much, it's great to be here, you know, Ted's obviously really great. They cut all that out. You will never hear an um, an ah, a trip up, you know, a verbal trip up, or, or you know, a swear word, or anything like that. It's all concertinaed into a very, very compelling 17 to 20 minutes of what they're actually doing. So all you guys that have watched video, since she had the gumption to be able to say, you know what, there's this new trend coming out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to capitalize on it, I'm going to go for this online video, and we're going to work out how to make these videos as compelling and watchable as possible. You guys have contributed to TED later on this year, so um, uh, June tells me that they will hit the magic number of one billion views on, uh, on video across all their different videos which was absolutely remarkable, but then, but then they change it again. And you know, they just compound the, the attitude of being uh, uh, delightful and engaging and uh, you know, the whole unexpected thing. Where when I was doing the research and looking at some of the photos, I went on their site and you can see at the top there, hey, we're in a summer break. Daily TED Talks will resume on September the 4th. Not sure what to watch, surprising. Even TED realizes that there is an element of us all that likes to be surprised, that likes to, as Google kind of does, you know, feel lucky, you know, surprise me, give me something I didn't already know. Because there, there are people that are so hooked on learning more and more from Ted. Um, any SEO people here? Or people that kind of understand it? One, excellent. Um, so I'll direct this at you now. Um, v v Vanessa Fox uh, joined Google in 2005. She, uh, Google's very much a closed shop. She was the only, she was the first person to get, uh, to get a job at Google and become a product manager that didn't have a software engineering degree. And she got asked to set up this site maps project, which was essentially, it's crazy to think now, but crawling all these websites takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. So this guy had this idea, why don't we just tell all the website owners to submit their sites, their, their, their site maps to us. And then we don't have to call them and we'll save lots of money. She said, well, that don't, don't work. Let's, let's come up with a kind of hybrid approach. So she set up Webmaster Central, uh, Webmaster Tools. But what was interesting is when she went out to the, 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 uh, the SEO community, which is massive, uh, she, they said, we're not going to give you our site. You know, what, what, what do you, you've got to give us something back. Um, we're not going to give you our site because then you just, you're going to know everything about us. And, and then you're going to de-rank us and then you're going to lose money. And, you know, all the black hat and all that kind of nonsense. Um, so she scratched her head and she went back to the people at Google and she said, uh, I kind of need this information. Now, we're not giving you that information for these people. And what she did was she turned it on its head. She went back to Kirkland. So Kirkland's like two hours away from Mountain View. It's ju just on the other side of Lake Washington from Seattle. She went there and she had to think about this and she said, we should do a kind of value exchange. So she went into Google and said, what, what's your biggest pain point? What's, what, what's the problem that you have most? And so this group said, oh, it's people with titles and descriptions. They don't do the titles and descriptions, which means the little snippets, you know, and the 10 blue links, they don't show up, so we can't show them. So, you know, you know there's lots of relevant websites, websites out there, but if they don't do the titles and descriptions, it doesn't work. They said, well, could you tell those webmasters that they need to do that, and then they will go away and do it, and then you can re-index their site? Oh, that's a good idea. And she continually did this throughout all the different departments and then came up with this community. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Sergey or Larry, one, one of the two, set a goal. They absolutely smashed it. Um, uh, they sent her off to Bermuda for a holiday to say thanks very much. I don't think she actually went because she was too busy. Um, but the guy, Shiva, the guy that initially set down that gauntlet, said, you know, this whole site maps or webmaster was an experiment that either failed miserably 
will succeed beyond our wildest dreams in making the web better for webmasters and users alike. Again, test and learn. It's the only way to cope with change. And, you know, they, they didn't fail miserably. It's probably one of the most visited uh, um, you know, web, web pages and communities uh, in, in our industry, you know, from, from a B2B perspective. Um, and it just shows that, you know, the fact that they were able to stick out uh, onto a limb, but she was also thinking about the value exchange. How can I delight those webmasters and let them know what, what's wrong with their site so they can rank higher and make more money? Um, this chap is Jaron Lanier. Now, Jaron is uh, the father of virtual reality. He is uh, the guy uh, who was the subject of The Lawn Mower Man, a film with Pierce Brosnan. Can you see the likeness? <laughs> Neither can he. He's very confounded by it all. Um, he uh, is um, the guy behind the Tom Cruise film Minority Report. All, all that crazy stuff that goes on in that is all about him. Um, I'm just throwing this in there because he's got a book um, which is absolutely amazing called You Are Not a Gadget. And I'm throwing this out there as just a kind of word of caution in that he's pretty upset with the way that the internet's going right now as far as social media is concerned. He refers to uh, people in Silicon Valley as cybernetic totalists who just believe that, the, uh, that, that it should be all about the internet and then the internet will be this big brain and then we never have to think anymore. And he says that things like Facebook deny us individuality and they deny us creativity because we already have to put ourselves in the box and identify ourselves as part of different interest groups. Uh, if you go to his website, very creative, um, jaremanier.com. Um, but, you know, I just throw that in there as a, as, a, as a kind of word of caution that I think that we do this a lot. You know, we go, oh, we can do that. And we've got this crazy thing over here and it's really great because it flies across the screen and then people can like it and all that kind of But we don't actually think about the end user. We don't actually, very often, actually, you guys are fit and you, you're, you're all over the sales. But I think that a lot of businesses kind of look at the technology as, as something fun and they don't think perhaps as responsibly as maybe they should. Um, you know, when I talk about Maggie, uh, Jaron's view is that uh, us with advertising, he doesn't hate advertising, he understands its place in the world. Uh, he, he loves the romance, you know, things like the Google ad, the, the kind of emotions that it can stir in people. But he says that as far as the millennials and, and the Maggies of this world, there's no such thing as passive perception. Young people today <laughs> remember our media as quaint, cute, but not quite fully engaged. Interesting. Um, anyone recognise this chap? <laughs> Stephen Fry. Uh, he's in the book. Uh, a lot of people found that unexpected. Uh, but he is very much an early adopter. Everybody seems to think he's a, an Apple fanboy. Um, I was partly responsible for... Uh, building a relationship with him at Microsoft that <laughs> ended up him bounding out on the stage at the launch of the Windows Phone, telling the world um, how wonderful it was. We didn't pay him. He's all about uh, biodiversity, as he calls it, and technology. But he's very much an early adopter. When, he, when Twitter came along, he looked at it and he thought, oh, this is silly. He saw an ad of someone, oh, I'm in a cafe. And he was like, well, what use is that to me? And he put it in his virtual drawer. And it wasn't until he was doing a documentary where he had to go across Africa, where he thought about the context of what he was doing. And he said on his blog, which was absolutely huge, and he has a big forum following, he said, I'm going to Africa, uh, I'm doing this thing, just fo follow me on Twitter, because I've only got a mobile phone and I'm not taking my laptop, because they're remote areas. And, you know, he took a photo of a rhino, he got on a plane, flew to a different country, uh, and he had 10,000 new followers. Then he took a photo of an elephant, flew to a new country, and he had 50,000 followers. And this just went on and on and on. And it's just a really good example of how celebrity, have, have, uh, people like him have been early adopters within the celebrity field. Um, some of you may remember this photo uh, in I think 2009, uh, January. He got stuck in a lift. And he only had 90,000 followers or something. Uh, and he took a photo and he said, I'm stuck in a lift, uh, ask who and whittle um, was kind of paraphrased uh, the tweet that he had. But by the next morning, this was front page news on newspapers and websites all around the world. 
because it got retweeted so much and he picked up, you know, exponentially more followers for that. It was just in that moment he thought, wouldn't it be great if I could recreate this moment for other people and just see what happens? And that's when he took the photo in the New York Times and said that this photo did more for Twitter's profile in this country and the rest of the world as Demi Moore's uh, uh, derriere uh, did after Ashton Kutcher took a photo of that and tweeted that. Um, meeting him, talking to him, interviewing him was absolutely amazing. Uh, we, we'll, we'll, we're trying to get the, the videos together, especially when he talks about the responsibility he feels now to the five uh, million followers that he has. Um, and he, and he you know, takes it very, very seriously. And at the end of the interview, I said, you know, come on, what's your advice to people? And he said this, you just have to love it when talking about the internet and technology and business. That you just have to love it. You absolutely have to love it. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the creativity that it gives you. What you have to be driven by is what fun and how unbelievably exciting it is. Um, so as far as him being an early adopter and constantly surprising people by responding to them, uh, uh, you know, he, he does a really great job for his brand. Uh, so there we are. We're, we're, we're at the end of our road together. Beer o'clock is nigh. But as you go back to your desk tomorrow, take a day off, actually. Go back to work on Monday. Go back to work on Monday. But as you start veering around this corner, I mean, all the research is great. You kind of know what's coming. But as you start veering around this corner, take this next slide. Print it. And stick it on next to your desk. And just remember that in order to engage with the youth of tomorrow, and actually to engage better right today, you need to think about being agile, being delightful, putting a smile on people's face, and being unexpected. And it is my fault <coughs> if I do all those three things. Maggie, very, very happy. Thank you very much.